G'day pals, welcome back to a new video. Today we'll be discussing state machines, particularly in Unity, but uh, this video should be useful to anyone making a game uh, who's just learning about state machines. So I've done something like this very similar in Godot as well. So as long as you can read C Sharp and you understand the principles of how that converts over to GDScript, you might be able to get some value out of this video as well. We'll have a bit of discussion at the beginning describing sort of why we might want to use a state machine and when we might want to use one. And then I'll take you through step by step how to build sort of an increasingly complex state machine until we reach something like what I make for Insignia. Let's not waste any time and get straight into it. First off, just some housekeeping stuff. In this video, we'll be covering state machines, obviously, as well as using the Aceprite importer. This is basically just to skip over some stuff about animators, which I don't want to get too deep into to keep this on topic. Uh, if you do use Aceprite, you'll be able to follow along a little bit easier, but if you don't, that's totally fine too. Also, we'll be continuing on from the 2D Movement Basics video, so that'll be in this playlist. And if you watch that and you don't have any other experience with game development, you'll be able to kind of follow along into this video a little bit more, more smoothly. So the first thing that I want to show you is my game Insignia and some examples where you might see some state machines working. Here in my scene editor, you can see I have an enemy. Right now, he's just doing some patrolling. He's walking around from point A to point B, and uh, he's basically just in a state that's looking for the player. If I go over and have a look at this enemy, we can see his behavior. He gets shocked when he sees us, he runs over to us, he tries to attack, if he lands a hit, he'll laugh at us. He has a few different attacks. So he can do like an overhead swing, he can stamp his feet if we block him, he can chain attacks. He obviously has hurt states, so he can get knocked into the air and tumbled, knocked down. And when he dies, he goes into like a split scan whoosh, separation. So there's a lot of stuff there, right? A lot of animations, a lot of different behaviors, and they all kind of work together to give us the impression that he is a living, breathing creature. Also, I want to draw your attention to the player character. So Armin has a lot of different animations he can do. We can look down, we can get into like a run position, we can start running, or we can just walk. We can do a dodge roll, we can jump, we can ledge grab, we can slide on walls. We can attack, we have lots of different attacks, like directional attacks, we have air attacks, lots of different things that you can do as the player that all need to be negotiated between, right? They can't all be happening at once, only one thing's happening at a time. So there's some kind of logic that describes which animation to play and what kind of behavior to be playing. So even things like the character's physics don't always work the same depending on what state we're in. If we're sliding down a wall, we'll fall much slower than if we're falling through the air. Here I have two more enemies patrolling around. Obviously they're not fully uh, animated yet. They're snooping around looking for me at the moment. Um, if I appear in front of one, he'll actually run over to the last place he saw me before looking around and then returning to his movement. So it's not just about picking animations to play. We can also use state machines to define more advanced behavior, more abstract logic that guides the strategies that an enemy might take. State machines in Insignia are what I would call behavior trees. They are hierarchical. And at the very top, you have the most sort of abstract logic. And as we go down, we head towards just base animations. This is a much more complex state machine because the player character is very complex. Um, but that's true to the way that I built it. So Armin has, you know, all these different animations in all these different contexts. And these are the context where you would see them. We have differences between ledge control versus wall control. Um, you know, we have uh, when we're on the ground, we have running, sprinting, that ready animation, we have skidding. There's only one node per thing you can do. Uh, there just happens to be a lot of things you can do. So I find behavior trees to be a really suitable way of handling logic in my game. But I know that this might seem like a lot and kind of overwhelming if you've only built simple games or you're just learning to make games. So I'm going to try to familiarize you with the kind of scenarios where you might need a state machine at first and the steps that you might take to grow that state machine, something more capable, something more like this. So in the previous video here on the channel, I talked you through player movement, 2D player movement. And uh, something very simple like this is super easy to make. And we've only got one script. The script is, yeah, you know, it's got a lot of settings and the whole thing is only, you know, 76 lines long. That's really efficient, right? You might be thinking, well, if I'm already here, I can't be that far from, you know, the game that I want to make. And maybe that's true. If your game's really simple, then you might not need much more than this. Having watched what I just showed you with my player character from Insignia, 
You can see though that there are some things that we would at least have to add to this to get something close to the game that I'm making. So when I first built my character Armin, he behaved this way and he was as simple as this. And over the span of like a year or two of building him out, I had a script called player control that was like two and a half thousand lines long. There was a huge if statement with lots and lots and lots of ifs inside of it trying to negotiate between are we on a wall? Are we grabbing a ledge? Are we in the air? Are we on the ground? And then all the different things that you can do inside of those states made it super complicated to actually manage at all. But the player character wasn't actually that complex. So as a viewer, you know, you can kind of understand all the different things that he can do and it's pretty straightforward. But as a developer, even having developed at that time, like a third of what I just showed you, I was like really, really deep into the like cognitive overload trying to read my script because everything the player could do was in one script. So something like this where we can keep, you know, everything the player can do at the start of a project in one script is a little bit deceptive. Eventually it's going to become cumbersome and will start affecting your ability to make design decisions, which is really, really critical and something that I want to save you from. That's where state machines come in. A state machine is a programming pattern where some structure you create is used to select between individual and finite states. The states define some behavior, which the state machine kind of operates until some condition where it then selects another state. That's basically what it is. What's really key about this is that only one state is kind of active at a time. There are two major, major things that will drive you to make a state machine once you've got a script that's too big. The first is to actually just be able to look at your code in a way where you can define things and look at one thing at a time. So if you just want to work on the patrol code, you can see that in a script called patrol and you can work on it separately from the search script. Once you've done that though, you may then start to realize that you'll be able to reuse these modules in other enemies. So you won't have to repeat yourself so often. You won't have to build the same thing over and over again for every enemy. Your game might have 50 different enemies and 30 of them might basically need to patrol between one point and another. If you've defined your patrol state once and in a way that's usable by all of your different enemies, say for example, rather than walk, we say navigate. And we define that navigate state in a way that's not dependent on whether it's walking or flying. We could use patrol for all different kinds of enemies. We define it once and we use it everywhere. That's the principle behind why you would build a state machine. So now that I've chewed your ear off and you well and truly understand why you would build a state machine and you're super excited to make one, let's go ahead and actually do it. We're going to use a character that I made for a game last Ludum Dare. This is for a game called Though I Walk. There are some animations that I'd like to bring in that I don't want to bring in from Insignia because uh, these ones are a lot easier to show off with the A-Sprite importer. So I've gone ahead and replaced the sprite, changed the camera size, made gravity a little bit less and changed the collider size to fit this character. And now we have something a little bit more appropriate for someone as small as this little dude. If you go window package manager, you can see whether or not you have the 2D A sprite importer installed into your project. This will come default with any 2D project and uh, just type in A sprite and it'll be there for those of you looking to follow along with this part of the tutorial. If you have an A sprite file that's created like this where you have tags which you can create by right clicking the frame numbers and pressing create new tag you can select a bunch of them say new tag and then uh, give it a name once you've done that and place it into your unity project that will create an asset that has all of the frames and the animations sort of pre-created for you this episode i'm not going to teach you how to create an animator uh, but since we already have this sort of pre-set up for us we'll be using that there are some import settings uh, just to make sure that the character works correctly. The default settings are pretty good. I like to give some padding as well, just in case I'm going to outline the characters. You don't want the texture to be so small that the outline gets clipped. Um, but yeah, now we have our character. So we can kind of combine these two things. Uh, the hooded character has the sprite renderer and the animator. So we could probably just place that right here and then make sure that we're on 000. zero, zero and assuming our collide is in the right spot, everything should be fine. If you click the animator tab, you'll see all of these tags that we created are now created as animations. To avoid any confusion, and there's a lot of potential for confusion here, what you're looking at is technically a kind of state machine. It's a, it's a basically an animator blend tree, and its job is to give you the power to define parameters, which it uses to define which animation it should play. 
you don't really need to use any of the fancy features that come with this. You can just tell it to play kneel or run or jump or die or whatever it is you want to do. Just bear in mind that it's not a scripting interface. You can't use this to define new behaviors or logic for your character. Its job is mostly to infer what should be happening based on parameters that you give it. I don't personally love it for pixel art because a lot of its features have to do with blending between states, which is much, much more relevant for 3D rigged characters, uh, less so for pixel art. So just to show you how this thing works, uh, we can make the default state run by just saying uh, set as default state and then hit play. And then now our little dude will be running on his own. Hey, look at that. The frame rate that this runs at is determined here um, by your frame properties and the duration in milliseconds. If we were to say 50 milliseconds and save, there you go. So on the way to building a state machine, let's go ahead and take our player movement script and start breaking it down into chunks that are kind of independent from each other. So an obvious one would be grounded versus air control. A really common way to handle very simple state machines is with an enum. And you might define it as say these three states. Let's call this player state and then create a new one called state. That's gonna be our current state. The way this basically then resolves is we would take all of our functionality that we want to be associated with idle or running or airborne. And we would create an update state function for each of the different states. We would have its own update and just choose between them. So something like this, a switch case will allow us to pick between the different states and then we can write some functionality in here, or we can defer to another update function for each of them. So something like update idle, update run, maybe update airborne. So we would create update functions for each of them and then exit conditions that let us break out of them. We might have a Boolean here called state complete and any logic that we would want for these to be running every frame we would put inside of this. And we'll get to that in a little bit. The next thing we wanna do is say, if our state is already complete based on what happened inside of update state last frame, let's select a new state before we update again. And that would look something like this. Basically, we just check our current parameters and we ask, okay, Given that we're grounded, you know, are we pressing anything on the input? If it's nothing, let's do idle. If we are moving on the x-axis while we're grounded, let's start running. Uh, otherwise, we must be in the air if we're not grounded. So let's go airborne. And here I would have some entry code for each of these. And depending on how complex that is, you know, we might break that out into its own function. So, you know, uh, we could call it like start idle. And then maybe we have start running and then start airborne. And so now inside of these functions, that's where I'd put the animation call. So we don't have a reference to that animator yet. Let's do that now. So now we basically populate each of the start states with the animator play for those states. For these animator.play functions, what's really important is that the string is exactly the same as the name of the state. So here idle with a capital I, run with a capital R, etc. So just to recap what we've done, is a very crude state machine where we have an enum called player state. This helps us define what the states are. We have an enum instance called state, which holds one of these at a time. We have an animator, which is going to help us do our actual animations. We have state complete, which helps us determine when we need to start a new state. We also created a function called uh, update state and select state. And each of these basically check each of the possible states and determine what to do at any given time, whether it's to continue playing or start a new state or operate as normal in that current state. It's a bit repetitive and you can see there's a structure here that we might want to break out into their own class system. You can imagine if we have lots of different entities that have the same kind of idle functionality and it ends on the same logic, you know, you might not want to rewrite it every time. And if it's all written in this one script, this is going to get very long very quickly. We're already past double the length that this script was when we first started. Nonetheless, we should be able to drag our animator in to the player movement script and see what happens. I'd forgotten to add the grounded check for idle input, so we weren't breaking out of that state when we jumped, but that should work fine now. So we hit play again, and now we have jumping and running and idle. Super simple. I should note though, that this is actually just a coincidence. If we make the jump height a lot higher, we'll notice that he'll start to loop through the animation because it's not actually reading his velocity. 
to determine what frame to pick. It's just playing through the animation at 10 frames per second. It's also a really nice coincidence that the run animation looks pretty good for the speed that he's moving at. Additionally, we might want to make the frame rate for the run animation be in line and in sync with the speed on the x-axis. If we take the body.velocity.x and pass it through to an absolute values check, we can actually stay inside of the run animation until our velocity reaches below a certain threshold. Then we can use that to modulate the speed of the animation. You can see here, if we add a really slow ground decay, we actually slow down as we come to a stop. This would be really good for games with an analog stick and analog movement, where moving the stick only halfway made the character run half as fast, and also made the animator play half as fast. With a little help from a mapping function that I love, that uh, I pulled from uh, the first programming framework that I ever used processing, we can basically take the Y velocity and map it from zero to one, and then play the animation frame corresponding to that. And the way we do that is something like this. Basically what this function does is it takes our starting value and maps it from one range to another. So our body.velocity.y is going to go from the jump speed when we press the jump button from 10 all the way to negative 10. That's going to get mapped from zero to one. That's all it does. So we're just converting velocity into animation frames here. And then we're just going to play the animation at that time between zero and one and then set the speed to zero so that it doesn't tick over while we're waiting. And uh, that's it. Look at that. So now, no matter how high we jump, it'll always look appropriate to our velocity. Pretty cool. So for fun, we could remove the ground check on the jump input. And now we get to do infinite jumps. And you can see how the jump animation still plays correctly, even if we don't start on the ground. So I'll say it as usual, if this is all you need, then this is a fine place to jump off. Um, I would say this is a very simple character. Obviously we've just scratched the surface of what a platform character can do. And there are so many more things, especially if you have combat in your game or enemies that can hurt the player, you might need a lot more than this. For a jam game, this is probably okay, but anything bigger than this, particularly if you're gonna have multiple agents in your game, enemies, NPCs, that kind of thing, you're gonna to wanna to stick around to actually building out a component-based state system. So I'm gonna show you now how to build a component-based state behavior tree, which is something that I use for Insignia and serves my needs. Uh, it may not serve the needs of your game and it may not be a particularly popular implementation. This isn't now an objective guide. It's very personal and anecdotal and I hope that you'll find some value in it. And maybe there'll be some healthy discussion in the comments about how I've decided to structure this. Um, and we'll all learn something in the end. But I think that it's very functional and useful, so I bet that you will too. So the first thing that we're going to do is in the project, we're going to define a state, and that's going to be in a new script. We can do that by clicking Create, C Sharp Script, and we're going to call it State. Now what's critical about this implementation is that I will be extending from mono behavior so that the states are components that I can drag into the scene onto game objects, but I won't be implementing any functionality to do with the state class that uses start or update. There may be states that do use update and start, but not as a default. Instead, we're gonna define some new functions that take the place of start and update and fixed update, but only get run when we tell them to. So I've gone ahead and tagged all of these as virtual. This means that we expect for objects that derive from this state class to override this function with their own functionality. So we expect them to have their own entry function, their own do, fix do, and exit. We also want to start declaring some variables to do with this. We notice that in our player movement script, we started to declare some of these variables. State complete is a really, really important one that every state will have to implement. Let's call this bool is complete. Another one that's really common is the time. So we want to know when the state started to know how long it's been running. Oftentimes we want to exit if a state's been running too long. We can also create a property that determines the current time by saying float uh, time is basically time.time minus start time. So this is like a little function that looks like a variable where whenever we check this, it's going to return the equation that relates to this. So it's just the current running time. I'm going to go ahead and also tag this as abstract. And basically this means that we never expect to create a thing called state. It's more like an archetype for what we will be creating states based on. It's just a template. 
For our boolean is complete, let's change this from a typical bool to a property where the getter is public, but the setter is protected. What this means is that any class will be able to check whether the state is finished, but only classes that inherit from state will be able to set their own is complete property. This is handled internally, but anybody else can read it. We'll also make start time protected, but we can make time public. By definition, properties with this lambda expression can't be set. The expression is always going to be evaluated when we call it, so we can make it public without worrying about being tampered with from the outside. Now we can create additional classes for each of the states that we want. We can go ahead and create new scripts for ground state, air state, idle state, and run state. Now it's time to start populating our state functions. Rather than inherit from mono behavior, we'll be inheriting from state. But since state itself inherits from mono behavior, it's kind of like mono behavior is the grandfather of our states. So they will still inherit the properties of a mono behavior by virtue of being states. We're going to go ahead and override all of those virtual functions so that we can start to populate them with our own logic for each state. Now let's go back to our player movement script and start grabbing all the functionality that came from the start functions and the update functions for each of the states and populate them into our state classes. This will of course create a lot of errors, but by thinking critically about the errors and how to solve them, we'll start facing some design decisions that will help us structure the rest of our state machine. For example, animator is a variable and a property that we expect probably every state will want to have access to, regardless of what it's doing. So maybe animator should be something that's accessible from the state machine or uh, that's handed to the state on entry something that allows us to always make sure that we have an animator. Whereas jump speed feels like maybe it's inherent to the air state. Maybe jumping is a property of being airborne. Maybe we'd even create an object that handles more information about the character to do with their sensory awareness, whether they're grounded, whether they're uh, up against a wall or other properties like that. For now, what I'll get you to do is just paste everything into each of the states and try to resolve what you can with the properties that we've already declared. So we'll change references to state complete to is complete, since we declared that as the common property that all states have inside of the state definition. So if we examine our air state, idle state, and run state, we can see a lot of common issues around body, animator, and grounded. So what we might do is now kind of make a promise to handle this outside of the states by going to the state class and declaring those objects up here. By thinking about those common properties like our animator, our rigid body, our input, we can actually paste them here inside of our generic state definition and kind of promise that we'll populate them later. What that will do is leave us with only red squiggly lines around things that should be defined specifically for the state properties. So naturally air state should probably have a jump speed variable because jumping has to do with going into the air. And the only thing that got left behind was our map function, which we can put inside of a statically accessible helpers class. Let's do that now. So we can create helpers.cs, make it static, and then put some static functions in here that we'll always come back to and use later. Then we can simply type helpers.map and that will work just fine. Let's go ahead and remove any redundant functionality from our player movement script and see how clean it becomes. We can remove our mapping function now we can start removing our player state enum and refer to this as simply state. We can remove our state complete boolean and instead we can start creating references to our particular states that we want with public state, air state, idle state, and run state. In the inspector, we'll be able to plug these in and populate them that way. We can be really specific and refer to them to their real names if we want to access specific functionality inside of them from here. But since they all inherit from state, we'll be able to set this to one of these, no problem. Let's go ahead and fix some of these broken references. So instead of state complete, it's state.isComplete. Inside of select state, we could keep this as a function if we wanted. We'll still be keeping the branching logic. And instead, we can simply say state equals idle state. We can do the same for running state and air state. Now, since we have enter functions declared for all three of these, we no longer actually need to have separate functions. We can simply say state.enter at the end. And whichever state we selected, that's the enter function that we'll be using. Now, of course, we can remove our update state altogether because the state knows who it is. So we can just call state.do. And whichever state we have selected, the do function will run for that state. Now, if we look at our player movement script, we've managed to cut out about a third of the code 
And we're free to expand our definitions for running, idle, and airborne as much as we like. And that'll never inflate or make player movement any more complicated. So the code should compile now, and uh, it will run when we press play in the editor, but it won't run as intended. Can you guess what's missing? While I'll give you time to think about that, let's quickly update our hierarchy. I'll create new child game objects for airborne, idle, and run, and then I'll attach the scripts that we want. Nice. Now we can actually see that the properties belong to these states. We also need to add those references in to the player movement script. That should be easy enough by just dragging them in. So did you think about what would break? Let's see if you guessed correctly. Everything. <laughs> no, we haven't actually populated the instances of the rigid body, the animator, the X input check, or set grounded for our states. Uh, they're still waiting for those to be instantiated. So right now they're going to be checking for something that's null and we'll need to create a way to populate them before we can use them. The first thing that we would think of doing if we wanted to populate the animator and the rigid body for all of our states is to set them up in the start function. Repeating ourselves here feels a little bit redundant. Maybe there's a way that we can do this that is a bit better. Let's go to our generic state and give it a function called setup. This will basically pass in the rigid body and the animator for that state. And these should never change for the runtime of the state. When working with more advanced state machines, you'll notice that there is this recurring and growing issue of needing to pass information back and forth between the states. So the animator, the rigid body, any inputs, um, and what I like to call sensor behaviors. So behaviors that have to do with understanding the world around, as well as things like memory. In state machine academia, we call this the blackboard. This is the information that states maintain and manage and access centrally. You can think of this as trying to create the kind of like central nervous system, the eyes, the ears, the brain and memory of a little robot. So we're sort of just starting to create that here. Now, since we don't have a state machine component yet, and we might not go all the way into, you know, separating out each of the different pieces for the sensor behavior, let's go ahead and make a reference to the player movement script and just call it input for now. Then we can replace these three checks with just input and set the input when we pass it in through the setup function. Now we can simply add this on the end of our little setup, and that'll pass all of this data that we've got through to the states. In actual fact, the only additional parameters that we really wanted were these three. We can't pass them in as variables, right? As floats and bools into this setup because we need them to be updated every single frame with the logic that we're running inside of the player movement script. So we need a reference to a class that's managing these not just the values themselves. So that's why we've got this passed in. Ultimately, we would take these checks and we would handle them in something that was just called player input rather than player movement. And that's what would go into the this part of this function. The third parameter would be player input. But for now, we're just going to call player movement input and we'll treat it as if it's only got those three parameters for now, since we've already got the body and the animator passed in directly. We can now go ahead and make these public with private setters. Now, back inside of our state classes, we can replace grounded with input.grounded, x input with input.x input. Now I'm pretty sure this will work. The only thing we need to do is set up the parameters inside of our instances for our airborne, idle, and run states so that they actually work appropriately. If we do want to remove those references, we can remove them from one place or the other. So we could remove it from player movement and just say air state dot jump speed rather than jump speed, and that will refer to the child version. We can also just remove it then from anywhere else. So if we just totally remove jump speed from here, now because there are no references, nothing will break. And then again, max X speed, this is kind of more of a design choice up to you. You might have different kind of run functionality. And so maybe the X speed as a maximum should be a property of the character, not a property of the run state. It's totally up to you. If we do keep it as a property of the character, I'd go back to the run state and I'd remove this and say instead input dot max x speed. Now we only have one definition that gets used and everyone's happy. And by throwing some background graphics in, now we have something that resembles the actual game that I made. Hey. So now the only thing that I really don't like about this is the fact that we have this jump string hard coded. Instead, what I want to do is bring in a reference to the animation clip called anim and just use anim.name. We can also have different animation clips for different instances of the air state. Let's say we've got different characters who all need to be in the air in different ways and their airborne states aren't all called jump. This will allow us to just plug in the animation that we want for those enemies and it will work that way. 
Now inside of our game object, under airborne, we can take the jump state and just drag it straight in. Idle, drag it in, run, drag it in. And look at that, it works. To round out this video, let's add one more interaction for kneeling, which you can do in the game. And we'll see how easy it is to add that. We're going to add a generic state for now that we just call kneel state and say kneel state dot setup. And then maybe here in the select state function, we would say if y input is less than zero, then go into kneel state and that's it. So from the perspective of our player movement class, which is acting as our state machine right now, all we really need to do to add a new state is just declare it and instantiate it and then figure out when we would enter into it. And that's it. The class doesn't need to get any longer. It doesn't need to get any more complicated. It's nice and simple. Now all we need to do is define the behavior for how kneeling works. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we have our kneel state. We can enter it with the animation that we decided to play. And then uh, as soon as we're not grounded or we're no longer holding down on the Y axis, we just say we're complete. So easy. So in order to give our player character the kneel state, let's just create a new empty game object under behaviors, call it kneel, add a kneel state, and then grab the kneel animation, go to our player and drag it in. That's all there is to it. So we hit play and now we can kneel. So it's only as complex as it needs to be at any point in that chain. And it's certainly not complicated. It's very easy to read this, to see how it works, and to expand it or troubleshoot it if something is wrong, because these things are finite and exclusive. So even for something very simple, such as a player movement script with only a few different animations, it's worth it to set up a state machine, knowing that you don't have to worry about the complexities that will come with expanding it. The final piece of the puzzle is to put a little bit of a bow on those variables that we declared that we never really used in any of our states so far, but I want you to have a system that works. So let's create a function called initialize, and add that to our state generic class. This is to make sure that the playback instances of those states, that is the start time and whether we're not complete, are reset every time we set a new state. Now, just in case you don't watch any future videos in this series, I do want to make note one more interaction that you should be aware of, which is the interplay between player input as something that should be able to interrupt states. If states can't interrupt each other, then you'll need to have conditions for when a state should exit that know about when other states should enter. So for example, if we are in the idle state and we press down, that goes into the kneel state at the moment. The only reason that works is because I'm checking to see if the player is pressing down to exit out of idle, right? That doesn't quite sound right, does it? Because idle shouldn't know anything about kneeling. So pressing down shouldn't necessarily stop us from idling, but Neil should be able to kind of step in front and overwrite idle. It should be able to replace idle if we do the input for Neil. So being able to interrupt states is an aspect of this. It's quite important. And there's a reasonably straightforward way to sort of implement this so that player input always trumps what the states are trying to do. Okay. So what we can try to do here is remove the check for if a state is complete in order to select it. So we just select a state every single frame. So then we declare a new state just locally inside of this function called old state. And then only if the old state and the current state have changed after this check, only if these two are different, do we then exit the old state, initialize the new state and enter the new state. We might also decide to reset a state if it had completed um, so even if this tree picks the same state as it was last frame, if that state had ended, then maybe we do choose to exit it and then reinitialize it. Sometimes you might need to refresh. So an example might be if we're doing an attack animation and the attack animation ends, and then you allow the player to hold the button down to just cycle through attacks. This will now allow that state to end and then reset without having to change into something else in between them. So if we were kneeling last frame and we're still kneeling, this won't have changed anything and we can just continue on our way and uh, ignore all of this and just nothing will happen. But if the input for Neil overwrites what we were doing, which was idling, now that'll just go over the top. If we're idling, you know, it's really only if we get taken off the ground by some object and we're falling through the air that we should exit the idle state. Otherwise it can just do what it wants. Same thing with the run state. We can just remove that check. And there you have it. 
So now we don't actually have to do any additional logic inside of each state to make sure that they're not stepping on each other's toes. We can freely overwrite states with player input as long as the state that we would choose is different from the previous state. Now, this video is getting super long. We've covered the applications and intent behind building a state machine. We've built a state machine using an enum, and now we've built a component-based version. And I'm gonna leave the video here. We'll come back with a part two for the really, really powerful stuff that you can do with state machines, particularly component-based state machines. In the next video, we'll be creating a state machine class that handles all of the playback independently of the player movement script. And we'll also be creating some hierarchical state machines. So we'll be allowing our states to have machines themselves. And we'll be creating a tree-based structure for advanced player controllers or enemy AI, where some states have more abstract control over sub-states of their own. If this video wasn't to your liking in terms of speed or information density, please let me know and I'll be sure to tune it for the next video. I'm really enjoying building out these components one by one into something that you could use for a game. And my plan is to have the actual components themselves be available online as resources for you to download and use as guides in your own project. So if you want to ensure access to those resources and you want to support what I do here on the channel, please become a subscriber on Patreon. Thank you so much. Your names are coming up in the credits. I will see you in the next one.